Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Pleasure Points Podcast. I'm your host, James Rohr. I am an acupuncturist and a dating and relationship coach who doesn't talk an awful lot about dating (laughs) because the things that need to be discussed have a lot more to do with what's going on inside of you than it does with uh, bullshit dating techniques and things to text. So in this episode, I actually share something that I use with a lot of my clients, even though I don't really talk about it that directly in the podcast, which is fairly typical for me. But you get the idea. If you're paying attention, you're putting the pieces together. (laughs) Anyway, uh, you can find me at uh, on Instagram at James E. Roar. You can check out my coaching work at invitinginlove.com. And you can email the show here at pleasurepointspodcast at gmail. So this episode doesn't need any more preamble from me. I hope you guys enjoy it. I had a great time with it. And uh, without any further ado, enjoy the show. Hey, what's happening? I am so excited to be here with you today. I can see the sun shining on the palm trees outside my new little podcast studio over here, down here in Miami, and it's just so nice to be out of New York. It's funny how we talk about leaving New York, like I'm out of New York, like you just got out of jail. (laughs) It's kind of how it feels. Even though I had a great time in New York, I had great clients there and everything was just like super nice. But man, there's just something about like, uh, I was talking to this old client of mine and she said it referred to it as a notch in your belt. And it's kind of what it feels like. I have like the, uh, like I have a graduate degree and, you know, my master's in NYC. It's like I survived. (laughs) I got some education on life and now, uh, and now I'm back here on the beach, which just feels so, so good. I mean, in the last like 36 hours, I've done beach walk, yoga on the beach, qigong on the beach, gone for a run, done a home workout, and I, I just feel so blessed. And uh, if you are listening to this in New York, um, you should get out too. <laughs> it's nice here on the beach or go to the mountains. You know, that's nice too. But one of the things that struck me was that I just was amazed that people would spend all this like time and money going upstate. It was like, and I was leaving all the time. I mean, I, I didn't want to go upstate because I found the traffic coming back into the city was just such an abrupt like reentry that uh, I just found it easier to, to leave. And with my son, with his mom in the Midwest, and then uh, with Jen down here in Florida, it was I had two great options to just get out. And I was like 15 minutes from LaGuardia Airport, so it was so easy. But, you know, at some point I was just like, I don't want to live in a place where I can't wait to get out of it. It just didn't feel good to me. It's kind of like when people are using meditation or something as this like, as this tool, it's like, oh, I have to, I have to meditate so that I can tolerate the rest of my life. It's like, man, that's really, that's sad. Especially if the thing that you have to tolerate is like where you live or the job that you have. I've been fortunate to be able to do my own thing for a while now, but I also worked my ass off to make sure that I could do my own thing. So if you're one of those people who finds that you have to meditate, otherwise your life is unbearable, maybe the answer isn't meditation. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Maybe it's just in creating something new uh, with your life. Maybe it's finding uh, a new job or you know mixing things up or maybe it is time time to leave and we're going to talk about that. But one of the things that I'm most excited about, I hope you enjoyed the podcast last week with Jennifer, but we didn't talk about like the most important thing, the thing I was the most excited about with this new Miami life for me, which is uh, for Father's Day, I mean, yeah, of course, living with her is great. Our relationship deepens, like we're doing all those things. (laughs) But the thing that uh, I was just so excited about, especially when it came to to domestic living, is for Father's Day, she got me this thing called uh, Tushy. I know you're smiling now if you've got one. And if you don't, this is like the thing you have to get. They haven't sponsored the podcast yet, but this is my blatant pitch to them. We got, uh, she got me a Tushy, which is basically this device that transforms your regular toilet into a bidet. It's this little attachment. It was super easy to put onto the toilet. 
and it's got this like little nozzle and this little uh, knob to the right. And whenever you're done with your uh, with your duty, you turn the knob and it shoots out a very very forceful stream that uh, gets your butt clean. And I got to tell you, it's a life changer. I feel civilized. <laughs> <laughs> but really with like the kind of trauma that my butt has seen over the years with uh with my health like I wish I would have had this 20 years ago because it is refreshing it's amazing it's like uh, I don't even have the words for it they have one apparently that also can hook up to your uh hot water like pipes so it can be warm water but the water down here on on miami is like it's so warm anyway we didn't need that but if you're in cold climates if you're in one of those places where like that first dump in the morning and the toilet seat is so cold and you have to brace yourself you might want to get the one that hooks up into the into the hot water but i'm just saying anyone out there that's working for tushy that's listening yo this podcast is called pleasure points we're a big fan of clean butts and healthy living and this is definitely the way to go so it's called Tushy. I think she wrote a book that uh, that I want to check out. Maybe I can even get her on here on the podcast. But if you don't have one and you like to be clean, especially if you're one of those people that like needs to shower after you poop, this might save you having to undress all the way. You just you spray the nozzle and uh, clean as a whistle. Though I will say that sometimes I have done it the old-fashioned way because I don't want my butt to be totally pampered. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. I don't want to get to get it used to such a luxury. It's like, I joke with Jen a lot that, um, she's so healthy that it almost does her a uh, disadvantage when she does want to eat some nonsense, you know, like I eat a lot of, you know, pizza or, you know, some kind of meat or French fries or something. Her body has a way harder time handling it. And I like to keep myself on just the right side of toxic so that, uh, if I do, decide to splurge my body doesn't totally freak out and have a meltdown <laughs> it's the problem with clean living it's like there was a time when i did a lot of yoga and uh like i would find myself just kind of sitting around at my house watching tv or whatever and i'd want to start stretching and i was like oh my god i've become one of these yogis but it's true it's like you just get used to being relaxed and if you miss yoga for a couple of days things start to tighten up there gets to be this kind of discomfort and that feeling totally sucked. But then I was like, I'm like a slave to stretching now. I was like, I don't know that this is really creating more equanimity in my life. <laughs> but feeling a little bit more stretched and out and relaxed does does help. But uh, I've never maintained a consistent yoga practice enough to to feel that, except for that that one month where I was really good. And I think that was a month when I was courting Jen. Because if you're trying to court a yoga teacher, you're going to start doing more yoga. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm super stoked to talk to you guys today because I wanted to talk about something that uh, I've been thinking an awful lot about, and I may have mentioned it in some really early episodes here, but I, I know, at least I don't think that I talked much about it, but it's been an experience that happens to me frequently, and I want to crowdsource it. I want to get your feedback on it. If you've had any experiences like this, please hit me up at pleasurepointspodcast at gmail.com. Let me know what your experience has been like. But it's something that uh, has just been so crucial with giving me faith and hope when I've been in uh, profound moments of despair or wondering if I was ever going to feel better or if things were ever going to turn around. And uh, it's also stuff that showed up. It's an experience that's happened or a feeling that's happened during good times as well. And part of it actually directly relates to, to living here in Miami, which is, you know, one of the things that I did yesterday and that I've been doing a lot since I've moved down here is I've started running. I actually started running, I don't know, it was maybe about four months before I left New York. It was even before the decision to leave New York happened. And what was happening there was that I was spending time. I knew that something had to change, whether Jen was going to move to New York or I was going to move back here to Miami. And so I started spending some time in, I don't know, meditation is just kind of too formal of a word, but putting my attention, my internal thoughts, like compass or whatever into like, you know, what is my future going to look like? I tried to reach out to the future to see, you know, what, what I could see. And 
it still wasn't clear New York or Miami, you know, and like keeping the acupuncture practice or not like that wasn't, that wasn't clear. (laughs) The thing that was clear every time I did it was I saw myself running. And the first time it happened, I was just like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I hate running. Never liked it. I love being fit and I love, you know, getting exercise in, but all my cardio I liked when, especially when I was growing up, when I was playing sports, when I was playing tennis, I was playing volleyball, you know, I played football for a little bit, like, you know, just being out and being active and doing those things is how I like to get my cardio. And anytime, even when I was on those teams that we had to run, especially distance running was the worst. I actually kind of enjoyed the ladder drills on the tennis court. We were like run and touch the line come back and do the ladders. Um, even when I did puke, you know, it was like, I, I kind of enjoyed that shorter burst, but just running and that long distance running, I would make fun of runners. I still kind of do <laughs> like, what are they running from? What is so, so hard in their life that they have to just like torture themselves with running. And, uh, but man, every time I would think about my future life, the one thing that was totally clear was I saw myself running this kind of like Forrest Gump image or something in it. I was just like, fuck, is that really, is that really going to be my life? Is that really what's going to happen here? Am I going to turn into a runner or has future me turned into a runner? And so I fought it. I fought it for a few months and I, I just couldn't shake it. And, you know, for me, that's how a lot of this sort of my intuitive things kind of happen is that I gave them plenty of chances to go away. <laughs> even if I got, sometimes I'll even say go away or, you know, just try to uh, more actively ignore it. And I keep waiting and hoping that it goes away. And it's when those sensations and those feelings or those visions don't go away, that that's when eventually I start to really, really pay attention to it. And uh, this one just wasn't going away. And so one day I was at the gym and I just hopped on a treadmill and I was like, well, I'm just going to go for a run. And so I ran, I don't know, I like labored through a 10 or 11 minute mile and, you know, thought I was going to die. And as these things tend to happen, I was talking to a patient of mine who's a runner and I was telling her a little bit about my experience. And she was like, oh my God, she goes, you have to download this, this app. She goes, I've been using this app called Nike Run Club. And they've just been totally amazing. She goes, they have these guided runs where the coach is like talking you through it. She's like, you're not running by yourself. And she's like, it's totally normalized parts of running. And she's like, I've been, I've been running since, you know, I was in junior high and I, she loves running. And she's like, and I love this app. It's really helped me to, to push myself. And, you know, that's one of these things where I try to pay attention and, and here it was where I was, you know, having this vision and I was kind of complaining about it. It was not kind of, I was definitely complaining about it. And, you know, she had a help and aid, you know, uh, something that might support me. And Nike is not sponsoring this podcast either, but Nike, if you're out there, what's up? You start, um, you know, hook me up with a pair of shoes and maybe if you pay all of your people a uh, fair wage, we'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> but their app is is great. So I downloaded the app and I started using it and I found that, you know, the mile run could turn into two miles of run. And, you know, they had some of them, they had like these tips on how to run on a treadmill. And some of them, they have interviews with long distance runners or Olympic runners. And it's just been so helpful to keep me focused on it. And uh, the other day I went for the longest run that I think I've ever done, at least the one, the longest run that I've ever tracked, which was like four and a half miles, which for you runners out there may not sound like a big deal, but it was, uh, I was, I was feeling pretty stoked. I was pretty buzzed by that. And in this process, I'm like, I don't know where it's going to go, but I've just been trying to embrace that vision of the future me as a runner. And even though I fight with it probably for the first half mile, every time I do go for a run, I'm finding that I'm like learning things about myself in that process. I'm discovering things about me, which is pretty cool. One, I'm discovering how weak I can be. Two, how tight my hamstrings and calves are. Three, how much I don't really like running. And, you know, it just kind of goes on from there. But when I was running on a treadmill... The, I was, chose the treadmill and had a mirror that I could see. And I was using that as an opportunity to do like energy work on myself. I would look at my form, but I would also just start like saying kind of affirmations or trying to get myself in a, in a good state, you know, and, and I was using this as opportunity to connect with my future self. 
I mean, even hearing myself say that, it just sounds kind of absurd. But that's what I was doing because I was like, well, I can't shake this feeling. So there must be some gold that that is here. I I have the profound faith in my future self. And so it's been an interesting, an interesting process. And I, I really believe that part of how I ended up moving down here and choosing to to change out of my practice was because I started running. More so just that I started to allow myself to shift out of old patterns. It really had nothing to do with running itself, except that that was a, a marker of that I was willing to do things differently than I've done them before. And I was willing to endure some of the discomfort. And I was really willing to go into, you know, a place that I historically I haven't really liked before. But the vision of my future self was so clear that I was like, well, if I'm going to be that guy who I liked, you know, he looked fit, he looked healthy, everything looked, you know, felt really good when I saw it and when I felt that. And I was like, if I'm going to be that guy, I might as well just start following the threads or the the breadcrumb that he's leaving there. And so, you know, perhaps if you're listening to this, you know, maybe you've had a, a vision or a feeling, a sense of of what future you is doing. And maybe you've seen, maybe they've changed their diet. Or maybe they've done adult shit. Like today I just signed up to get a, like a life insurance, physical exam, blood work and all this stuff. I feel so adult. It's disgusting. (laughs) But somebody told me to do it before I turned 40. And so I was like, oh, I should probably do this. You know, so maybe when you check in, if you've, if you've had these kind of feelings or inclinations of yourself in the future and you see that that person is like, they have habits that you don't have you know, maybe it's time to, to pursue it, to check it out, even if it sucks. And believe me, I get it. You know, I'm really, it's just like anything else. You know, I could focus on how much I can't believe that, you know, my future me is like a runner, but I can also be really grateful that they aren't a biker. (laughs) All of the gear and the clothes and the things that we live where we live in Miami there's like all these triathletes and like, it's a major cycling area. And so you see these like packs of bikers on the roads here. And I'm super stoked that when I looked into the future, I didn't see myself as one of those, but you know, if you're, hey, if you're a biker, it's totally cool, man. But if you haven't done that exercise, or if you haven't even had that experience of your future self coming back to, to talk to you, I'd love for you to be open to that as a possibility because this is, and this is the thing that I really want to talk about here, which is that, you know, this is something that's happened to me since I was, I think when I was in college, I don't remember. Well, it happened before then, but there was a, a moment when I was really sick. I think I've talked about it before when I like, I couldn't make it to the bathroom in time when I was in college. And there was a day when I was just like sitting in the shame and I've been really frustrated and lethargic and just like, Ah, I just didn't feel good. And I, I felt, I saw this, like my future self. I wasn't even trying. It just like came in for, like kind of like descended from the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, he just looked at me and he was like, brother, one day you're going to wake up and this is all going to be gone. You'll still be alive. You will feel great. And there's an amazing life that you're going to have. And this is like where I believe in faith or, you know, what I would call grace. Because I didn't, I didn't deserve it. I did not deserve it. But, you know, it was just one of these things that, that came to me in a moment of really of just weakness and despair. And so when people have heard my story of like, you know, how do you, how did you feel better? Or how did you heal yourself? I, and I didn't heal myself. I just put myself in a better position for my body to thrive. Part of what made that process easier was that I had doubt, kind of surface level doubt. And I had a, a whole years and years of data to support that doubt. But I also had this connection to this future me that felt really good, that was healthy and living a great life. 
And there were many times over the next eight years when I was really sick that I would feel that energy and, or I would hear that voice like brother, little brother, it's going to be okay. And I didn't, I didn't know. And I, sometimes I talked back, sometimes I get really angry and I'd be like, well, if it's going to be that good, why can't it be that good now? <laughs> why can't it be that good now? It's an intense question. But I would just feel this kind of warmth and I just knew that it would happen. And I said, okay, if I just keep, if I keep going, if I keep exploring and trying to follow the breadcrumbs, my body will heal. I will have created an environment internally and externally around me where this physical form can thrive. And, you know, when I think about it, you know, I don't know when I was, when I was in high school, I, I had this image of what I found out later to be Stanford's campus. I saw myself walking in front of what I found out later to be Hoover Tower there on, on Stanford's campus. And I didn't know that at the time, at least not consciously anyway. But I had this this kind of vision that was really, it was crystal clear. And I saw myself, I was wearing like a red hat and I was there in front of the Hoover Tower. And it was a little bit later that I've, was looking through like college brochures and stuff. And, and I saw that picture and I said, Oh my God, I, I've been there. I I'm there. Like my future, my future me is there. I've seen myself there. And I looked at my test scores and they were good, but they weren't good enough. I didn't think to get into Stanford. And I talked to uh, my student advisor, my, my, you know, my college guidance counselor in high school. And I was like, Hey, I, you know, I have this really strong feeling that I'm going to, be able to get into Stanford and then I'm going to go there. And she laughed and she was like, you don't, you don't have the scores like that. That's a nice dream, but that's not for you. You shouldn't even put money into applying there. Yeah. Real helpful. And, uh, I was like, well, I, I don't know. I just think I'm going to, I think it's going to happen. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I applied and I didn't get in, which sucked. <laughs> and so I thought that I was going to go, then I was like, all right, well, my backup plan is read college. I was a huge Gary Snyder fan, the poet. He's got these amazing poems, Rip Rap. And he's, I just loved, I loved his essays. This guy was so fucking smart. He had a big interest in, in Japanese culture and Zen and Buddhism. And I was really, really moved by his poetry, especially in high school. And he went to read college. And I liked what he talked about with unlearning. You know, he said, he's got some quote that said, you know, I realized when I was in college that uh, as much time as I was spent learning, I was going to have to spend as much time unlearning. And the book that I wrote, Unlearning Stress, that that unlearning word is kind of uh, it's a little homage to that quote that I heard from Gary Snyder. So I thought I thought for sure I was going to go to Reed College. I went out there to check it out as a visit, and I absolutely hated it. It was just this, like, as soon as I got on the campus, my stomach turned, everything tightened. And I was like, this is not good. And I remember I was sitting there and I was like, man, what am I going to do? I said, I got denied from Stanford, Reed College, which I thought for sure was going to be where I was going to go. Like, I don't want to be here. The other schools that I applied to, I just didn't have good feelings about. And I'd applied to Notre Dame and I'd gotten into Notre Dame. My dad went to school there and this was like, this big benchmark for me as a kid. Like I was like, Oh, you know, my dad was like, work hard. So maybe you could get into Notre Dame and you could go there. And it was this thing. And, you know, it was funny because in junior year was when I started seeing energies and like crazy shit was happening. Senior year, I was deeply entrenched to work with the, the Blackfoot medicine man. And like going to a Catholic university was like as far away as, you know, you could possibly get from where my head was at at the time. But I was sitting there on Reed's campus and uh, I was just really feeling the despair because I was like, well, if I don't go to Notre Dame, I'm just going to have to like wait a year. And for someone who liked to follow the rules like I do or did and still do to a certain extent, that was like kind of a soul crushing thing. I was like, oh my God, what is my dad going to think? What are my parents going to think? You know, if I just take a year off and, you know, reapply to the things and re reevaluate re myself and... I was facing, you know, east and looking at the the sun, you know, in the mid morning. And when I was thinking about going to Notre Dame, I saw these bald eagles fly over the Reed campus to the east. They were like, you know, kind of the sun was silhouetting behind them. And 
I was like, oh, that's an interesting sign. And I was like, all right, you know, maybe I read too much into it. Or maybe I was, uh, the truth of it is I was probably just mortified to tell my parents I wasn't going to go to college for a year. <laughs> I'll say, well, I got to sign with the Bald Eagles, but, uh, you know, whatever. So I ended up going to Notre Dame. And from like the moment that I started uh, my freshman year at Notre Dame, I just couldn't shake the feeling of being at Stanford. I could, I kept feeling myself there. And it was as though like my f- future self was almost like uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, you know, where they would come in and I'd see myself almost landing in one of those phone booths and just being like, come on, like, you know, don't give up. We're, you know, this is where we're going. We're, the journey is going this way. It's going this way. And by the way, I heard that Bill and Ted's, uh, I heard that there might be uh, another one that's being made which is awesome, especially considering like, have you seen all these memes with Keanu Reeves? The guy is like, he drops all of this wisdom. It's amazing. And he's had such a crazy life. I think his sister died and his, his wife died. Maybe two wives have died. The guy's endured so much heartache and uh, listening to him speak now, it's like, he's like a prophet, which is like amazing that, you know, it's like, if we want anybody from the future coming back to help us. It might be this enlightened sage of Keanu Reeves. But anyway, so I was I was there and I would feel my future self like just calling me out to Stanford. I would see the images and my best friend from high school was out there and we were comparing our experiences and you just couldn't get like any further apart. I mean, uh, at Notre Dame, it was single sex dorms. Girls couldn't be allowed into the guys' dorms, I think, like after midnight on the weekdays, 2 a.m. on the weekends. If you got caught having sex, you'd be kicked out of student housing. If you got caught and it turns out your roommates knew and they didn't rat you out, they also got kicked out of student housing. The whole thing was just like crazy. And I was like, wait a second, I had more freedom as a senior in high school living with my mom than I did as a freshman in college away from home. When I was a senior in high school, we moved to this new house after that haunted house stuff. We moved to this other house where there was like a upstairs house. And then there was a separate kind of apartment, self-contained apartment down below. And my mom was like, just, you can live in the apartment. I had my own entrance and exit, my own kitchen, uh, my own living room, a bedroom, my girlfriend would come and go and like as she pleased. And it was like, it was so chill. And then I'm going to, to Notre Dame where we're crammed into this little dorm or this, you know, this like room with four other, with three other guys who and all of these rules and oversight. And I was like, this is just totally messed up. And so I worked hard and I got good grades there at Notre Dame and I reapplied and I said, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not going to be at the mercy of this kind of vision forever. And I don't want to be half in, half out anymore because that doesn't work for me. And so I was like, well, I'm going to apply one more time. You know, I'm going to apply again to get into Stanford. And if it doesn't work, I'll just make Notre Dame great. I'll just do the best that I can there. And, you know, it'll be fine. I'm adaptable. It'll it'll work out. And by some kind of miracle or something, I got in, which was startling, especially considering that like the acceptance rates were even more strict or they were, you know, it's harder to get in as a transfer than it was just another general application. But I was stoked. I was stoked. And so, yeah, I I ended up going to Stanford. And so like that vision started to come true. And it's like, I wonder about these things. Like, is it a vision? Is it a feeling? Is it, is it my future self coming back to communicate with me? You know, the present past future, is it, are we talking about time that's like stacked over itself? I, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, is it a glitch in the matrix? Not sure. But what I've found is that when I'm not sure, trying to like allow myself to open up and to feel or to ask guidance for my future self uh, is super helpful. And look, I'm totally like, I'm saying future self, but I'm totally open to our constructs of past, present, and future just being totally like wacky. But I do think that there, I mean, since we seem to, all of, most of us anyway, seem to experience this kind of linear time, you know, that this is part of this illusion, you know, this is, that's, it is part of this experience. But I think there might be like some, some time travel. We might be able to kind of like hit that spider web that is us and send a ripple 
that can go into the future or go behind. And one of the things that I've done, this might also sound kind of really out there. Uh, I wonder if, if you guys have any experiences like this, but what I've made a point to do really, especially once I started to feel better, uh, when my health started to turn, I've made it a point to remember those times and, and places when I didn't feel well and I felt my future self coming back to give me that hope. And I've chosen to like go back. I've spent some time in meditation to go back and to like send that message, which is so trippy. It's kind of like, like one of the techniques that, that happens in some of these healing worlds is like a soul retrieval where you like go back and get yourself. Maybe I'll do a whole other episode on that, but where you kind of go back in time and you like reclaim yourself, this idea that parts of your soul, especially with trauma, can get kind of like fractured off of your energy field and doing a soul retrieval, you can go back, you can journey and, you know, reclaim these parts of yourself. And, but I don't, I don't think about it like that because, you know, the benefit of, of some hindsight is, you know, I was building the muscles that I needed to, in order to share stories or to be a better practitioner or to be a better coach, you know, I had to endure those things. So I don't want to retrieve any part of myself, to, you know, to take away that learning process. But I do want to give hope and encouragement. And if I can lead a, a breadcrumb or help to, you know, guide that choice process, then, uh, then I'm happy to do it. It's like, it's just caring for the self. Yeah. So I've gone back and done that. And so when I was at Stanford, it was a similar, you know, I've gone back and I've like planted those visions again. And so, you know, part of what I love, I've talked about Joe Dispenza's book a few times, Becoming Supernatural. And I've just so, so enjoyed it. And one of the things that he talks about there is to make a mind movie. And the mind movie is great because you basically go through and you you pick out some music and you pick out pictures or images that, that you like. And then I've put some words over them some affirmations, some I am statements that I'm growing into, you know, and if even if it's things that haven't happened yet. So I started doing this um, right around the time that I started running where I was started to, I wanted to more consciously kind of like claim or create the future uh, that I was, that I was seeing or that I was sensing. Cause sometimes I think, you know, I don't know what the fuck, like, you know, we think about why do you feel so alone? Why, when I felt alone, why have I felt alone? And uh, I think in part, it's just because my awareness was shut down. My, my chi, my energy was blocked. And so I was unaware. I was unable to see all of the information that is available all the time around me. Part of that, I think, being the future self. Or maybe it's God. Maybe it's your spirit guides just kind of taking the form of your future you, right? Or maybe what we think of as God is really just your future you. I don't I don't know. It doesn't, these kind of distinctions are fun to think about, but it doesn't make a difference to me one way or the other. But I don't know anything. You know, let me just, again, be clear that I'm just, I like to talk about it as the experience occurs to me and it occurs to me like the future self is is coming back. And so, in times when I've thought, well, you know, I can't really see, like, did I go to A or did I go to B? You know, was I moving to Miami or was I staying in New York? Or was I, you know, starting, restarting an acupuncture practice or was I writing full time or, you know, whatever it is. And sometimes where there's some gaps or space or that uncertainty, the beauty of that is that we get to make, we get to make it what we want. You get to start to imprint your neurology in a way that makes you feel good. And so with the Joe Dispenza stuff, he talks about these mind movies. And so I've started making these movies and, you know, I'd write in the affirmations of the things that I was creating, you know, so whether it's income or health or my relationship, all of my relationships with Jen, with Wyatt, with my ex-wife, you know, I can put affirmations into all of that. And the idea is that when you play the movie that you've made and it's entrained with the sound you know, you you start to reprogram your body. You see yourself, you see these nice images and it starts to make it more real. And the beauty of the moving picture with the music 
is a lot of your senses are being recruited. And so that's going to accelerate the kind of the new neurological programming that's happening. And so what I found as I did it was I'd like close my eyes and, or even when I was just living in my day to day, I might look at a blank wall and instead of noticing the blank wall, I would see like a, a glimpse of that mind movie that I was making to see myself in that future scenario that I wanted. So, you know, if I had done this when I was in high school, I would have, you know, more actively like created the slides based on Stanford and what I was seeing there, you know, or like one of them that I, I made a new one last night. And one of the things that we put in there, you know, Jen, and I, we started adding some stuff about our wedding, right? Because we're having some uncertainty about where do we get married? You know, what's that going to look like? A big wedding, small wedding? Do we just, you know, say screw it and elope? You know, all of these things are options and, and we haven't really had any major clarity around that. And so what we started to do is in the mind movie, I started affirming that, you know, we're happily married. The wedding is, a uh, you know, exactly what we want it to be and that we're super stoked on the outcome. And part of what I love about that is that even just kind of getting in touch with the outcome, which is kind of what the future used, I think, how that works, especially if you get these kind of impressions where it's like, you know, I have an impression of me being really healthy and thriving. And part of that, like the actionable information that I saw was, well, I, I, this guy, this guy runs. I don't know that much else about him, but I see that he runs. So let me start there and then see what else can unfold in the picture. And, but the end goal is like, this guy is like happy, healthy. He's having a tremendous impact on the world. His clients are stoked. His family's really excited. Everyone's healthy and thriving, you know? And so focusing on that outcome and affirming those outcomes allows for that space between where I am now or where you are now and where you want to be. It allows the universe to like create those steps. And maybe it's just one step that's illuminated or maybe like the halfway point is illuminated and your future you or the universe, your guides or whatever know that like that halfway point is what is going to spur you into action. Or maybe it is just that that final outcome, you know, because listen, it happened, right? I said the image was me at Stanford. There was nothing in the image that said I was going to have my freshman year there. I just assumed that that was how that was going to happen. But, you know, that's an assumption that I was making. I still got to spend three great years there, you know, but I also had to be willing to, you know, deal with the rejection and to be resilient to do that, you know, and, and I, really the, the place that that resilience comes from, <laughs> it's just because I've already seen it. The future self showed, you know, it showed it to me and I've seen it. And one of the things that's, you know, what is this like, how does this titrate down or filter down into, into like how my life works? is or how you know and how, you know like who the fuck cares about how my life works like how this can be relevant to you is how do you make the decisions that you make and it's so easy to like come up with the pros and cons list all right you you make all the things and you're like well this and this and this and this and this and at some point when i was a teenager i just decided that if if there was a vision, if there was a, a strong kind of feeling or inclination, I was going to follow it. Because if I didn't follow it, I just, I don't, I just did, didn't feel like things were going to go well. It's like having all of the neon street signs telling you to go in a particular direction. And you trying to tell yourself like, nope, nope, didn't see that. Nope, not going there. Nope, not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and when I think about like, you know, why did I end up going to where I went for college? Why did I go to acupuncture school? Why did I end up moving to New York? Why did I get divorced? Why am I down here in Miami? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Any of these things. The really the short answer is, is because I've seen it or I felt it. Sometimes I hear it. 
And a lot of times, those initial times when the contact is made, I don't want to hear any of it. I don't want to feel it. I don't want to know about it. And I certainly don't want to become whatever that thing is that, that it might be showing me. But when it keeps going, especially if it's something that I have like control over, you know, which I do, like I can choose to run or I can choose not to run. When I have control over these things, like over the amount of energy and input that I put into the system, then it's like, okay, cool. So why did I do what I did? Well, because I, I felt like it. And that's it. You know, and even if my family or people close to me don't understand some of the decisions that I've made, even if I don't understand some of the decisions that I've made, I just have chosen to follow that kind of that future self. And, uh, you know, sometimes the road's like pretty windy. Sometimes it's a, I spent a lot of time arguing with my future self, begging and pleading for more help or faster healing you know, trying to imprint or, you know, use this kind of time frame, this linear time. But in shifting back into this place of feeling and feeling that alignment with that future that I want makes a huge difference. So if you've had these kind of feelings or if you've had dreams or sensations where you picture yourself six months from now or a year from now, especially if it's not just kind of like some sort of like coaching workshop, you know, goal setting bullshit. It's not bullshit, but I, you know, I don't like goal setting if it's not one of those, but if it's, if it feels, you know, if you can like feel another presence in the room with you, or if you hear something that sort of sounds like, sounds like you, but it's like a cooler version of you. And especially if what they're telling you isn't something that you really want to hear right now, but you know, it strikes that thing inside of you that resonates is true. My suggestion is to listen to it. And that if you find another voice pops up, it says, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Take this podcast and this moment as the universe telling you to pay attention begging you to take action in alignment with that future. Especially if it's the future where you're happier, where you're healthier, where you're in a greater state of balance or flow. And perhaps even more aligned with being in service. I think that being in service and, and being able to maintain a state of gratitude about that is a really good place to be to help generate good feelings that can lead to better health for us. And if you're not sure, if you're not sure, but you feel like you might be getting some impressions, just you can wait a little bit. Breathe into it. Pay attention. Take note. But maybe you wait a little bit longer for a little bit more feedback. That's what I've done. And it, it's, you know, it's been helpful. Because I can, I can be hasty in some decision-making process as well. And if you're not sure, if you aren't, if this just all sounds crazy, you're like, oh my God, I wish my future self would show me something. Well, then there's a great opportunity to dream. You know, maybe you can check in with yourself and just say, okay, cool. Like, well, how would I like to feel in six months? What school would you like to go to? What would you like your job to look like? And start making that mind movie. Start, start crafting that future you. And I think that in the process of doing that, what happens is there's a certain amount of stagnation in the liver that is moved and also some stagnation in the kidneys that might be moved. The liver helps us with taking action. The kidneys help us with a, the, a proper unfolding of your destiny. So if there's some blockages there, I'm talking energy blockage. It's not actually in your kidneys or your, or, or your liver. It's a different energetic kind of concept of an organ according to Chinese medicine. But a kidney imbalance can show up also as low back pain. So if your low back is hurting, it might be that there's an energetic or a spiritual or emotional block there, especially as it relates to the smooth unfolding of your destiny. Perhaps fear has taken hold and that fear is preventing you from seeing 
you know, that lifeline that your future you is throwing to you. But if you were to take that time to actively imagine, how would you like to feel? As you start to engage with that, you might realize that there's a whole bunch of other wisdom or impulses or guidance that's coming for you. Because I don't believe that we are ever alone. That the times that I feel alone, it's just simply because I've made a choice to feel that way for whatever reason. And that part of the restoring of the flow brings us back into a state of balance with all of our relations. And part of all of our relations includes, I believe, our past and our future. So with that, this is awesome. You guys are great. Thanks so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, I'm super excited to be back here, dialed in with the podcast. I'm so glad we're back up on iTunes too. Um, thank you all for the words of encouragement and help and support. And uh, let's do this thing. So hit me up, pleasurepointspodcast at gmail. Let me know if this was resonating with you, if you've had crazy experiences where your future self has talked to you or where you've in this moment gone back and connected with your past self and you felt like it's made a difference. You know, I'd love to, to hear all of these kind of stories. You can check out my coaching work at invitinginlove.com. There we're doing, you know, helping you to overcome anxiety so that you can be awesome with all of your relations so that you can feel good and, and bring that out into the world. And so you can check that out there. I'm on Instagram at James E. Roar. And uh, man, I just love you guys. Thank you so much for this. And I'll catch you guys next time. <laughs>